To Erasmus, the least important part of that text was the running Greek text. That's the least important component of his work. Historically, what happened was that Greek text changed the world. I don't want to throw my faith away just because when I'm reading through Paul, I need to get to because of the angels. And I have no idea what that means. They're like, oh, the whole thing's useless then. We have to, at some point, acknowledge not just fallenness, but finiteness. And if you think that you have everything nailed down, then your problem is a really basic one of pride. You are listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. It's been a delight to talk with you guys. I've been learning from you in this uh, series of discussions, the way I've been learning from you in our long series of discussions privately over the years. And I always just rejoice to be with brothers in Christ who share a confidence in God's word upon which I base my life. Back in our second podcast, Tim, you gave an overview of the spectrum of textual absolutist positions. Could you just refresh our memory real briefly on those? Yeah, I would lay out five positions in relation to the TR and the KJV today that are textual absolutist positions, two extreme forms and three more moderate forms. The two extreme forms would be Ruckmanism, the idea that the King James Version actually is new revelation from God that corrects the autographs, and then uh, KJV onlyism, the view that the KJV alone preserves the autographic wording today, no other text or manuscripts do. Those are the more extreme form forms. In more moderate views, there's what I would call KJV defenders, uh, kind of a, a looser collection of people who may not make any appeal to the original languages or an original language text, but just defend the King James Bible. Then there's a, in recent years, been a group that I call KJV slash TR defenders, who uphold both the King James and the TR as uh, absolute authorities that are above revision. And then lastly, there are those that defend the TR itself, TR defenders, um, who would be perfectly fine, at least in principle, with revising the King James Bible or making other translations from it, but they're concerned to defend the TR itself, typically the TR behind the King James Bible. In this episode, we want to cover the story of the TR and of the King James Version. That's why I asked you to lay out these positions, remind us, and I think it is so important for Christian charity to make these distinctions that you've made. And yet we disagree to some degree with every one of these basic positions on the textual absolutist spectrum. And I think that the narrative of the TR and then the narrative of the King James are important ways to resituate people's understanding of these all important documents. And you know what? If all I had was the TR, and the King James, I would have, and I would have two inestimable treasures that could safely take me to heaven. You know, they're not Jesus. You know what I mean? They could give me the gospel. They could give Christ to me. And they did for the first 18 years of my life when I didn't know that anything else existed. And I trusted those who said that I shouldn't trust uh, the, the others when I uh, got into them. So let's, let's talk about that story of the TR. And let's talk about the absolutist understanding of the relationship between the TR and the King James. So in general, in their view, the King James was following up on the legacy of the TR and the modern day King James defenders are following in the steps of that legacy. But it, is that really accurate? That's a really good question. I, I don't think that it is. Certainly they see themselves as simply continuing that legacy. And again, there's differences in their views. Some of the really educated ones would never claim the kind of thing that uh, takes effect at the grassroots level. But at the grassroots level, most of the people who are defending the King James Bible and the TR have this two streams view of perfect transmission, where the TR is really just a transcription of what's already in the Greek New Testament manuscripts. And the KJV is just a translation or even a transcription into English is how some of it would think uh, of what was always there. So there's this idea that there's not really textual critical work going on. There's not really choices between variants. We have these two different choices. One camp believes in textual variants, us, and the other camp believes that God's word's always been preserved through the TR, through the KJV, and they're all just the same. This is where you get a guy like Del Johnson at that time at Pensacola Christian College in 11 of Fundamentalism videos. We watched those videos in my youth group. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That is hardcore because that's not exactly teen level material. No, it was not. Explain why in a little while because I saw it as a teenager too. Or similar ages, um, he actually gets up there and says that textual criticism is evil. 
Mm. It is a leaven, and he equates textual criticism with criticizing the Bible. Right. He's saying, in his view, that is not necessary. But, of course, we know that there are multiple Textus Receptus editions. I have somewhat cheekily said that it isn't the Textus Receptus, it is the Texti Recepti. <laughs> there are plural. And again, I'm getting back to that Matthew 5.18 passage mm. where if it's got to be perfect, it's got to be perfect. So tell me which TR edition is the perfect one. I've pressed that question on many TR defenders, and I feel like I get all kinds of different answers. Let's give our own answer. Where Where did the various TRs come from? What did the editors of the various TR editions see themselves as doing? And let's start with the first printed TR, not the first published TR. The other way around. Oh, no. No, yeah. The Complutensian Polyot oh, was the first printed. <laughs> yes, I am right. This is going this on guy. the internet. By definition, I am right. <laughs> what What did the Catholic editors of the Complutensian Polyglot, meaning that's more than just the Greek text, but it certainly had the Greek text in the New Testament, what did they think they were doing when they created... I, you know, I don't know that everybody can agree on what counts as a TR, but in general, sure. this and is— let me, let me talk about that sure, too, go ahead. first. We, we could define TR in a couple different ways. There are some, and it gets used in different ways in the literature. There are some people who use it broadly of any of the printed text prior to 1831. So any printed Greek New Testament text from 1831 can be considered a TR. I think that's an appropriate definition in that one sense. There are others who restrict it more specifically to Erasmian editions. And I, I'm fine as long as we know what we're talking about, defining it that way. Um, most people that we're talking about in this textual absolutism spectrum, when they talk about the TR, they're referring to one very specific text behind the King James Bible. Though they don't always know it. They don't always know it, and they very rarely spell it out. But if you pin them down to be specific, right. that no, is I have what to say, in, in my collection of um, doctrinal statements from King James only churches, most of them, and schools and camps and mission boards, most of them don't mention the TR. A lot of them do. Only one of them that I know of, and this is a private, uh, like little group, Kent Brandenburg and Thomas mm -hmm. Ross. Oh, yeah, they are the only ones who specify it's Scrivener's TR that and is the perfectly preserved. Their biblical God. theology specifies it too. They, him, Brandenburg, and a few other guys were commissioned to write "Thou shalt keep them," kind of a attempt at a biblical theology of preservation. They do spell out specifically the Scrivener TR, which I think was a shift for some of those guys because Thomas Strauss, at least prior to that, had defended the 1598 Beza edition. <laughs> And I think maybe that was a slight shift in his Absolute position. Absurette did something similar. I understand it. Yeah, yeah. And it certainly it happens. So however we want to define TR, if we can just take a broad view of early text and then narrow it to specifically, uh, uh, specifically Erasmian text. The CP, of course, is first printed but gets stuck away in a warehouse um, until the 1520s. So Erasmus then is the one that ends up producing the Greek text that we typically think of as the TR in this stream of uh, Greek printed text that come ultimately to influence the King James Bible. So the question is, what was Erasmus doing? What was he thinking as an editor? And here's what has oftentimes been misunderstood by people who are defending the King James Bible and sometimes by quote-unquote anti-KJV only authors who just aren't aware of Erasmian scholarship. Erasmus begins his project in 1504 when he comes across the writings of Lorenzo Valla and he decides that just like Valla did, he wants to write annotations on the text of the New Testament, mostly philological, some exegetical, and some textual. But he just plans on writing a list of notes and publishing that, just like he republishes in 1505 uh, Lorenzo Vallo's book. Over the next decade, as he starts comparing Latin and Greek manuscripts and Latin manuscripts to other manuscripts and Latin manuscripts to the form of the Vulgate, current in his day, uh, authoritative in his day, he realizes that there's more textual variation uh, than had been noticed. And he, he becomes particularly bothered by solecisms in the Latin Vulgate. He just What's feels like solecism? Uh, um, grammatical errors and right. less precise ways of speaking. He thinks the Latin text should be a much purer form of Latin. So he decides then in 1512, not only is he going to write notes or annotations, he's going to produce a revision of the Latin Vulgate. And he begins to work on that as a second component of the product project. It's not until 1514 that he decides, somewhere probably in August, he decides, you know, the best way to support a revision of the Vulgate will be if I include a running Greek text in the column next to it. Now to Erasmus, his text is going to have three components then. Notes, a revision of the Vulgate, and a running Greek text. The last conceived part of that project was the running Greek text. To Erasmus, the least important part of that text 
was the running Greek text. That's the least important component of his work. Historically, what happened was that Greek text changed the world. It reshapes the entire religious landscape of Europe because at the same time, we have uh, this Renaissance return to the sources, Ad Fontes, and the reformers breaking out from 1517 on, you know, Luther, the 95 Thesis, and they're desi desiring uh, spreading across the continent, desiring to go back to the original languages, and now they have a printed Greek text. So it's almost, from a secular perspective, we could call it an accident of history. I would call it an act of God's providence that something that Erasmus didn't intend to give a great deal of attention to and didn't think was all that important ended up uh, reviving a Protestant understanding of Scripture and of faith and of uh, the Christian faith. And, and the very first of Luther's 95 theses, the famous theses, before he thought he's going to start a Reformation by God's grace, actually talks about a translation error in the Vulgate, mm. attentiam agite, do penance. Oh, yeah. That doesn't make any sense unless there's a standard by which to judge what counts as an error. Yeah. And that standard has to be the, the Hebrew and Greek. Right. Which and Erasmus Which is is, said Erasmus laid the egg with the Luther, the Luther hatch. That's exactly right. He did, and he was always careful about it. We we have to understand when we evaluate Erasmus himself as a scholar and the work that he produces. Erasmus is functioning sort of with a mixed internal identity because on the one hand he's a part of this humanistic project, hu humanist not in the sense of the the modern day way secular we use that word, meaning secular right. or atheist, but meaning part of the Renaissance humanist movement to revive the classical learning in the original languages. So you've got Erasmus the humanist that wants to go back to the Greek text, but you've also got Erasmus the Roman Catholic monk and priest who still has a treasured place in his heart for the Latin Vulgate as the standard Bible, the Bible of the church. And both of those impulses come out in the way that he works on his text. And both of them at times pull the text in opposite directions. So he decides by 1514 that he's gonna print this Greek column and the longer he works with manuscripts, the more variants he realizes there are. So he'll print a Latin revision in his main column and a Greek text that matches it most of the time following Greek manuscripts and correcting the Vulgate to it. But then other times, and he describes he was hesitant not to make revision too uh, quickly or too forcefully. In fact, let me read just a quote from him where he talks about how in his early um, editions, he says, this is him writing later in the later editions, which we'll talk about in a moment. He says, in the first edition, I made changes sparingly. This is changes to the Vulgate text, which has the Greek text to substantiate it. I made changes sparingly out of fear that some people would not tolerate very much novelty. <laughs> Again, he's fighting textual absolutism in his own day. They don't want the text revised. They don't want it changed. So he's, he's making changes, but they're baby steps in some ways. He says, afterwards, I, I made more quickly changes um, and so that all the language of the New Testament by, might be straightforward, but still truly Latin, with the exception, even in his later editions, he's saying there's exceptions of some words and expressions that are too widely received to admit of change. So he's revising the Latin Vulgate to match the Greek manuscripts, but freely acknowledging there's some exceptions where the text is just too precious to people as it's found in the Latin Vulgate. So in those situations, he revises the Greek to match the Latin. And a lot of times as people look at his text, they'll wonder, well, why isn't it just Greek corrected by Latin or Latin corrected by Greek? And the answer is both of those identities in Erasmus conflicting with one another and pulling in opposite directions. So he writes in 1516, this first edition of a Greek Latin diglot, and the Greek is really just there to substantiate his revisions to the Latin Vulgate. Wow, no, that this is stupendous. And, you know, I've known some of this, but I gather, and I want you to confirm for me, a lot of the fleshing out of these details you're getting because you've actually sat down and read what Erasmus wrote. You fed me some of this and I've just been fascinated. You know, um, a lot of this feels like it's lost in the mist of history, but mm -hmm. then you see here's 80 volumes of the guy describing his viewpoints and all kinds of things. And you can go back and read for yourself now in English. If you have the library or the access, you can see him saying these things. So we're not, we're not doing reconstructionist history here. <laughs> We're actually repeating, right, what yeah. you've read in yeah. Erasmus's own writings That's exactly that are now right. available and haven't always been available. That's true. Some of this is quite recent. Most of this has developed within the last 50 years. There's been just a surge of Erasmus scholarship uh, ever since Brill commissioned a, a critical edition of all of his works, the Opera Amia Desideri Erasmi. But yeah, so today we are in a position historically to know a great deal about what Erasmus was doing in his Egypt. motivations. Yeah. His methods, right.
And okay, that's very much already not fitting with the two streams mm. hypothesis. And Erasmus is supposed to be one of the good guys. I have actually seen King James only as trying to include him in the pure church somehow. That's a rather difficult thing to mm -hmm. do since he never left the Roman Catholic Church. Stephanus and Beza come along later. Let's skip to them. Okay. Um, Stephanus, not a whole lot later, 1550. Beza, his main edition used by the King James translators, was 1598. Tell me about the what what did the editors of those TR editions see themselves as doing? Yeah, I think most of them, Stephanus specifically, sees himself as continuing the legacy of Erasmus. So he's still essentially producing a revision of the Latin Vulgate, further refining it, also, you know, printing diglots for the most part. There are some exceptions, but mostly printing diglots. Then Stephanus comes along and prints for the first time a critical apparatus. But what he started with is essentially just Erasmus's text. He's not making, he is changing the text. He's making revisions, but I think the total count might be like 400 minor changes to the text from Erasmus's fifth edition. So you get minor changes in the text, but that same trend towards conservatism in the text that was present in Erasmus's age is still shaping Stephanus and still shaping then Beza. Beza comes from a completely different place theologically as a, you know, Genevan reformer but he's still essentially working with the text of Erasmus. So what tends to happen is that the text form kind of congeals. It's being revised. They're making changes to it. There's certainly no perfect verbatim agreement between all of them, but that revision that Erasmus was already hesitant to do too much of, they become even more hesitant and the text takes on a little bit more of a, a codification, if you will, a, a steadiness. And I'll give an example of that where we can see that at work. So Revelation 1.8 is a, a wonderful example of what's very clearly a printing error in Erasmus. And I would argue that this congealing takes place as early as Erasmus's second edition for a couple of reasons, which I'll spell out here in a moment. Um, in, Erasmus, or in Revelation 1.8, the text talks about the Lord God, Hatheos is there. And as either Erasmus is transcribing or a printer is creating that text from uh, 2814, the Greek manuscript, there's a really funny ligature in there and somebody looking at it, Erasmus or a printer, makes a mistake and accidentally leaves out Hotheos. They drop God out of the text. You can tell it's a mistake for two reasons, three reasons. One, because of what the manuscript has. We know the manuscript Erasmus was using it and it had God in the text. But two, Erasmus prints in his Greek column the omission of God, but his Latin column still has the deuce. It's still right God. there. So very Latin, clearly right. a mistake. And there's no note or annotation where he explains a difference here. This is just a printing error. But in the second edition, Erasmus says, oh, I must have done that and I must have had good reasons for it. And now he changes his Latin text to match his Greek text and he omits God from the Latin column. He doesn't have any basis, but he's already developing this, well, I'm sure I had that right, kind of an attitude. And so the text congeals through Stephanus, through Beza, when they list textual data there at all, they list support for God and zero support for the omission, but they don't change the text. So the text tends to kind of congeal from a couple of different, for a couple of different reasons and uh, goes forward through with only minor alteration from that point. Can I, can I jump in there on that? Yes. So, so um, I, I didn't mention this in my, when I was telling my story earlier, but I'm getting a PhD uh, in the textual transmission of Chrysostom's homilies on Romans. Mm. And Aren't so we all? <laughs> one of the things that I've had occasion to do is actually look at the, so you have a, a um, in the early 1500s, I think it's 15, in the 1520s, maybe 1528, you have the Edidio Princeps that's published. It's that's published the from first one, edition. First edition. It's published from one manuscript. Um, and then, so I've actually looked at uh, what subsequent editors use. So in the Bodleian Library, you've actually got the printer's copy for the next editor in 1612, who I think was Henry Seville, one of the King James translators. Mm -hmm. So he's actually one of the King James translators, but his life project was the work of Chrysostom. Right. Um, and so he gets the first printed edition and he collates and makes comments about that. So his printer's copy is the previous edition with a few notes in the margin. Um, but then when you have the edition in the 19th century um, that gets done, and there's other editions along the way, then it's his edition from 1612 with notes in the margin. So it's, it's the material methods that are used by early textual scholars that push towards leaving the text unchanged and just 
touching it in a few different places, the places that you happen to notice mm. it, because it's, it's just the means by which textual scholarship right. is moving forward. And so when people are like, well, it's not till, you know, the 19th century or whatever that you get these, you know, an actual new text. Well, that's just, that's not just the way that the biblical text will work on. That's just the, those are the tools that they had. Right. That's their technology. It's the technology. In that day, so that's it's a technological, it's works. a technological question. Exactly. Um, that I, imposes certain limitations on the sort of textual scholarship that can go forward. Yeah. And you've I, always got to wonder, like, what's the goal of the editor? Do, you know, and it may not be to establish in every detail oh, the that's right. photographic text. It yeah. may be just, this is what we have and we explain our differences. In, in fact, those. Erasmus and Beza are both explicit at that point. They don't think that the text that they produced is necessarily always the original text. They freely, in their annotations, disagree with it. Again, as he's printing that text, it's to substantiate a revision of the Latin Vulgate, and he wants it to be a modest, gentle, light updating because it's the church's text, and he doesn't want to mess too much with the church's text. And he also constantly tells people, if you want to know my true opinion, read the notes. For Erasmus and Beza, the most important part of their text was the notes where they very often disagreed with the reading that's found in the text. And if you don't understand what's going on as these editors are working, you'll read their text and say, well, hey, they judged, you know, 1 John 5, 7. For example, I was taught while I was in Bible college. We know for certain that Erasmus believed 1 John 5, 7 was the original text because he eventually included it in his editions. But he explains in a two and a half page note why he doesn't think it's part of the original text. Yes, it's in his text because of this hesitancy to revise the Vulgate much and the uh, criticisms that he gets socially from pushback from changing the text too much, but he freely expresses in the notes that's not what he believes the original text is. And the same could be said of most of the really big important variants. There's discussion taking place in the annotations between each of these editors where they're freely acknowledging, well, I don't think that part's actually original. I don't think 1 John 5, 7 is original. I don't, I have serious questions about the story of the woman caught in adultery or serious questions about uh, the ending at the, of Mark's gospel. They're debating these things freely. There's not certainty from them as editors, but it doesn't reach the point for the most part of drastically changing the text. So we need to understand that as they're editing, for them, their opinion is primarily expressed in the notes, not in the text. Let me mention then two or three other reasons why I think that text kind of congeals. One is that what I called the chronological snobbery of new technology, as Peter, Peter mentions it, that, you know, there's, that's just the way that they're handling things. And they're so convinced, well, we've got printing now and we're able to do this. We must have gotten it right. So they stick with it. A second is just the prestige of Erasmus. He's such a well-known name. Nobody wants to make drastic changes to his text, even if they think he's wrong. Uh, a third would be the Aldine Bible in 1518. Erasmus became convinced in his third edition he had lots of good support for his readings because the Aldean Bible supported them so often. What he didn't seem to ever realize, according to Brown and Kranz, is that the Aldean Bible was basically just his text reprinted with a few minor changes. So he thought, oh, somebody else came to the same conclusions I did. Lots of support here. And he lists it now as a textual witness for his third, fourth, and fifth edition without ever realizing that he's basically citing himself. <laughs> it's like finding your old paper and citing yourself and saying, man, I really like what that guy wrote. And so that gives a, a sort of congealing flavor to the TR. And here's what we need to understand. Here's the core thing. The TR then doesn't bring into a printed text exactly what's in the manuscripts. The editors are making text critical decisions. They're very often incorporating from Erasmus on readings from the Latin Vulgate that were never part of the Byzantine stream, never part of a Byzantine manuscript, certainly not all the Byzantine manuscripts. So the character of the TR broadly is a mostly Byzantine text but with incorporated Latin readings. And E.F. Hills, again, you mentioned one of the most scholarly, if not the most scholarly defender the TR ever saw. He freely acknowledges this. He lists nine major readings that he sees Erasmus as having brought in from the Latin Vulgate. And the funny thing is, they're some of the biggest ones still defended by TR defenders today. 1 John 5, 7, Acts 8, 37, big chunks like Acts 9, 5 to 6. And people that are defending those as though they've always been part of this stream are just ignoring that historically they didn't come into the Greek text until 1516. I've literally seen all those passages, of course, mentioned on Facebook by people who cannot read Greek or certainly Latin. Yeah. They just do not know the history. Yep. And if they're interested in truth, which is what we said we're pursuing here, then they need to acknowledge it. So the King James translators come into a situation of some fluidity mm -hmm. because there isn't a perfect standard. 
there is a congealed close to consistent standard. There aren't huge numbers of differences among TR editions, but um, if I judge correctly, I think translators can and must have a harder job than, um, sorry guys, but textual critics, um, <laughs> because a textual critic like Erasmus can feel reasonably confident that most of the people who are going to be reading his text have sufficient education to understand the an textual annotations. But the King James translators are, they say, they're doing this work for the very vulgar, you know, whether they succeeded or not, uh, we can let others judge, but they've got to m make choices that people can't uh, come along and and there's there, there's not a, the same opportunity to communicate um, some textual uncertainty. They actually did have textual annotations in the margin, so they did do that sometimes. They said some copies read this or that instead of what's in the text, but they've got to choose. They've got to do textual criticism, and it's going to go into English. So talk to me about the story of the King James. When it came to textual criticism, what did they think? they were doing. Good. One of the first things we need to recognize about how the KJV or KJV translators work is that they're not all sitting together all at once coming to consensus in a big room. No, they were in 72 separate rooms <laughs> all working on the entire <laughs> Bible. You know, it's funny time. you shared that Everybody story earlier that. about the uh, 72 translators all separately going out coming to a perfect translation, coming together and finding they all agreed. I heard that story as a young man that was, and I wouldn't charge anybody else with saying this, but that was my mom's understanding of how the KJV was done. Aww. She had read that story and somehow misinterpreted it as about the King James. And so she claimed that they all separately went and provided individual translations, came back together and miraculously all agreed word for word. So if you've ever edited an academic volume, you know that the real miracle in that story is that they all met the same deadline. Yeah. <laughs> true. That is true. Uh, so <laughs> you, you make a good point because especially, <laughs> and that's today with email and computers and text messaging where we can connect so closely. They didn't have any of that. And they're dividing in the first stage of their work. The King James Bible is produced over three broad stages. In the first stage of their work, they're separating into six small teams at Westminster, Cambridge, uh, I just went blank. Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster. And so they're in separate little rooms with, you know, eight, ten people at most, sometimes maybe three or four at most. They have different editions of the Bible. Somebody in one room may well have a copy of Erasmus. Somebody in another room may well have a copy of Stephanus. They're not all tied to one exact Different editions edition. of the Greek New Testament. Yeah, different editions of the TR. So they're not all one tied to one edition. And what they end up doing, and we can assess this not so much just by what they say, but by looking at their text and what right. they've done, we look back at what they've done and we realize the end product, whoever was doing what at what stage, the end product doesn't follow any one of those Greek texts exactly. So the King James translators did textual criticism. Yes, exactly. And actually Scrivener, and we'll get to him later, mm -hmm. comes along centuries later, more than two centuries later, two and a half centuries, and carefully i mean this has got this is the most exacting work i've always said he's got a dickensian name you know scrivener the scribe <laughs> is sitting down and judging okay when beza and stephanus disagree and those were almost certainly in the hands of the king james translators mm -hmm. where which one did the king james translators side with and he actually tallies this up and although, again, we're, we're going to get to uh, Scrivener later, on my website, the kjvparallelbible.org, I talk, uh, I have a page, the Witch TR page, and you can look at Scrivener's work on this. He spells it all out in real detail. He shows 111 passages in which the King James translators chose to follow Beza against Stephanus. Again, we're not talking about massive and significant right, things here, right. but... Uh, some of them, some of them are more significant. We'll get into that too. But we, we're we're also not talking about the perfect every jot and tittle text, exactly, because they had to do textual criticism. Okay, 111 passages in which the King James translators went with Beza against Stephanus. 59 in which they did the opposite, so they went with Stephanus against Beza, and 67 in which here's here's where we can bring in. Uh, the Latin Vulgate, in which they differed from both texts and went with some other reading, either, and this is what Scrivener says, from the Complutentian Polyglot, from the Latin Vulgate, and from several other Greek New Testament editions, Colonnaeus of 1534, other Stephanus editions, and the Aldine editions, and from various editions of Erasmus. Think of the work it took Scrivener to uncover all this, mm. but it's verifiable. We don't 
we don't have to know what the King James translators thought they were doing in, in this aspect. We can just go look at what they, what they did. did. Yeah, exactly. And I'll point out, again, the most learned TR and KJB defenders have recognized that. So let me quote E.F. Hills for a moment. He talks about the fact that the TRs differed and that therefore the KJV translators made decisions, textual decisions about which reading to follow. He doesn't deny that that took place. What makes me and Hills or us and Hills different isn't a denial that the King James translators did textual criticism. It's whether we believe that textual criticism done was done as fallible humans trying to serve and worship God or as humans specifically guided by God. Here's what he says. He's talking about the marginal notes that sometimes uh, raise textual variance. He says, these notes show us, this is Hills, that the translators were guided providentially through their thought processes, through weighing every possibility and choosing that which seemed to them the best. He's not denying that they were textual critics. He knows that they were. He's studied enough to know that they were making textual decisions. What separates us from Hills is simply that we don't claim that their textual decisions were supernaturally, providentially guided by God, and he does. A friend of mine always says, um, you know, did God's providence really stop in 1611? Yeah, or does it exactly. continue? And that's what it's like. How is that different from, say, the ESV translation committee? Right who are doing exactly the same thing, they have a whole lot more evidence available to them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they always get it right anymore than I think the King James, you know, sure. they, they're, they're, they're learned men, they're, you know, some of the learned men of our age and some of the learned men of, of their age, um, you know, there are certainly, you know, things you could, if you wanted, you know, to nitpick, you could find some serious errors on the part of some of the King James translators, as I'm sure you could, the ESV or the NAV or any other major Bible committee, mm -hmm. um, you know, but, whatever that is, like, how is that different? Right. And the only way it becomes different is if the spirit was at work in 1611 in a way that he isn't today. Exactly. Well, let me represent our opponents. And on this, they are our opponents. There are brothers, but there are opponents. This is what I'm pretty sure it was R.B. Willette said. I was trying to find the quote while I, we were talking. Pretty sure it was him. Sorry if I'm wrong. He said that the difference is the King James translators, and I believe he includes people like Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza here, were doing this work in the context of faith in the preservation of God's words. So the, the way our textual absolutist friends in the King James only world tend to talk about this is until Westcott and Hort came along in the 1880s, and again, we'll get there, um, everybody believed in the preservation of God's words. And so anything they were doing can't even properly be called textual criticism. How would you guys respond to that? Well, um, just as an illustration, uh, where I work, CSNTM, we're putting on a conference this this week, and I was sitting with one of my coworkers who is from outside the area of text, textual criticism. He's one of the, my newer coworkers, so he's still getting the hang of who all the people are. And uh, I was in his office just yesterday, and he sat down and he said, so most of these are unbelievers, right? Like, that's what I've come to understand is most of these text critics are unbelievers. And I was looking through the list with him. I said, well, he's a very conservative evangelical that guy, I'm convinced, is a brother in Christ. He's Anglican, but I'm convinced that he's my brother in Christ. I know him well enough for that. And I, I, at the end of the day, there were just a hand, a small percentage of the whole thing where I didn't know if they were Christians or not. And he just kind of sat back in his seat and he said, you mean most of these people are Christians? And I, I said, yeah, yeah, I, I, I know most of them. I've like... I've had at least one of them come preach at my church before, you know. Uh, yeah, the, the story I heard in King James Onlyism when I was there is that all textual criticism is evil and all textual critics are out there to criticize the Bible. Who would do that except an unbeliever? And and the story, you know, that I was told was that, you know, so I at least, and this is, you know, where the, some of the positions get a little muddy, you know, that yes, theoretically, the Bible could be retranslated today. And that would even be an admirable thing, but there aren't enough honest Bible scholars alive today to translate the Bible. And yet we actually have, it, it's, you know, the type of learning that we have today, learning Latin and Greek at very young ages is less common, but we have, we're blessed with an abundance of brilliant scholars who are, you know, you think of someone like Dirk, Dirk Youngkind, who we mentioned his book, or Pete Williams, we'll get to his book in a little bit. You know, Pete's on the ESV translation committee. He's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He's incredibly brilliant, and his love for the Word of God is 
I would definitely match like Pete and Dirk up to the King James Translation Committee and say, absolutely, I'd be. Story about Pete. Um, Pete, I, when I worked for Dirk, Dirk worked for Pete. So Pete was my grand boss. And I think that was the word one of them used. <laughs> um, you know, how some people have, uh, if they come from uh, immigrant families, you might retain your native language and speak it at home, even if you speak a different language out in public. I was at a Christmas dinner with Pete Williams one day, and the language that he and his daughter were speaking back and forth, teenage daughter, I believe, Hittite. They were talking in Hittite to each other. And I, I kind of turned to my wife and I said, I didn't know that was a language. I thought that was just some people in the Old Testament. Like, that's... Not only is it a language, but he's talking to his daughter in it. Yeah, we, we've all heard, and I, the Trinitarian Bible Society put this in the quarterly record. Yes, theoretically, it would be possible for us to revise the King James Version, but we doubt that men of sufficient knowledge and godliness exist who could do this work. Of course, I'm wondering a couple things. Is that true for all of their Bible translation projects? Do they insist that the people working on the Persian translation project, I actually asked a man who's working on that project, he didn't, he didn't answer recently, hasn't answered yet. Did they all start learning Hebrew and Greek at five? Because that is what the quarterly record mentioned. I'm also thinking, what does it take to judge such things? Um, in order to really know the skill of a scholar, you tend to need to have the same skill set, need to be in that field in general, unfortunately. And that's the way, I, mean, I can't judge the work of engineers. <laughs> the way engineers can. I can know if I can drive across the bridge, that's something, but I, I, my, my knowledge limits me from making that judgment. Um, but from my judgment, working in this field, and we all work in this field, we do have many brilliant men and women today, many, many, there are, their books are filling the shelves around us. Um, we are not ignorant of these things. It's not as if this, this couldn't be done. Okay, now. Well, let we, me push back into the, to answer ahead. your question. That You answered the question on the first side by talking about the godliness and capability of the scholars. Let me also push back against the idea that pre-KJV textual criticism was done by people who believed a different view of preservation. They're really taking their textually absolutist views and reading it back into those right. people. If you actually read what Erasmus, Stephanus, or Beza said, or the KJV translators about the text, none of them held that view. Erasmus was adamant that he didn't think any text could be perfect, that the work of clearing mistakes from manuscripts was a work the Holy Spirit uh, uh, approves of, and that it was a work that would never be done. He just didn't hold that kind of perfectionist view of preservation. So, so not only does King James onlyism slander good people and call them unbelievers for doing the work of textual criticism, it unfairly enlists on its side people who actually took the textual confidence view and not right. the textual yeah, absolutist and, and, view. And I would say, you know, you can look at, you know, you could look at any Bible translation committee and you could say, well, that person who is part of that committee had views that I disagree with. Sure. But if you're going to apply that standard, then you have no Bible at all. Erasmus, right. you know, Erasmus was a runaway monk. Who, <laughs> didn't he dedicate his first edition to the Pope? He also got a letter of commendation from the Pope, which he printed from his second edition on at the front of it, just to say, look, even the Pope approves of my Bible. And, you know, so just... if we're going to say that because someone has connections to, say, Roman Catholicism, they, then any Bible that's tainted with that is, is no good. So the King James yeah. is in the wrong stream. Well, I did not know this. Yeah, not just that, but even the, the Greek manuscripts. That a lot of people have right, exactly. are Byzantine Greek manuscripts. And a lot of those have colophons. You, we can see you know, who wrote them. And, you know, it might be shocking to see that some uh, scribe who copied a book of the Gospels that's closer to the King James than to the ESV um, was thanking the mother of God for giving him the grace to complete this work of, of uh, copying. Yeah. If we take the view that no one can do good textual or translational work unless they agree with me, two things. Number one, we'll end up having no text that we can use. Number two, we're in a totally different line of people from the good and godly men that we look back at, whether that be Luther using Erasmus tech, Luther's convinced that Erasmus is on his way to hell, right? The bondage of the will, they debate back and forth. He says, pray for this Erasmus guy. He's going to burn in hell. But he had no problem using and translating his text. The King James translators in their preface bring up the idea that we should not judge men by their persons, but by their work. They were perfectly fine with quoting a heretic. And they raised the example of Augustine quoting Donatus. This idea, well, I can't use that text unless it came from someone who agrees with my beliefs. It just doesn't have good history behind it.
So I would argue that also when we think about the KJV translators as textual critics, there one, there's one or two other places that we should look beyond just the work of what they did. Yeah, like where do they actually talk about their work of textual criticism? Yeah, do they? They do. Um, they're in individual sermons. They often raise text critical issues, so we can see them doing that. In the notes that we have uh, today of their draft work on the King James Bible, we can see them discussing variants, sometimes disagreeing about variants. And I'll share an example of those at the end here when we get to in a moment. Um, but we also can see them talking about textual variants in their marginal notes. And if you're familiar with the King James Bible, you realize that it has marginal notes that are listed under three different types of symbols. There's an asterisk symbol that lists a cross-reference. There's a dagger symbol that lists a more literal translation that the, than they thought was suitable for the text. And then there's a double vertical line symbol. And under that double vertical lines, they listed what they called differences of readings. And in the margin or in the preface to the King James Bible, we talked earlier about Miles Smith's great work. It has three basic sections. The first three headings are a section about slander. The next nine headings are a central section where he uh, argues against textual absolutism. The last three headings, he zooms in to look at the specific work that they were doing in their revision of the Bishop's Bible and two little editorial notes about procedures, one of them having to do with the way they use synonyms. Uh, or maybe overuse synonyms by some people's estimation, and the other one having to do with marginal notes. So he has a section of the preface where he talks about marginal notes. It's important to understand he doesn't talk in that section about all those three types of symbols. He doesn't talk at all about cross-references. He doesn't talk at all about dagger symbols. He exclusively talks about the type of marginal note that's included under the double vertical lines. And the reason for that is there's no objection to cross-references, and there's no objection to more literal translations, but he's facing real pushback to the idea of including in the margins what he calls differences of readings. Well, what does he mean by that? They don't carefully distinguish in the actual type of note when they're talking about this is an alternate way to translate the text or this is an alternate reading found in other manuscripts of the text. So you mentioned Scrivener early do, earlier doing this careful work. He sat down and he counted those notes and tried to figure out which ones are about translation, which ones are about textual criticism. In his first count in 1845, he said 18 of them are about textual criticism. <laughs> and then a few years later, he recounted and said, you know what, 35 of them are about textual criticism. And then in his final work, he said, you know what, 37 of them are about textual criticism, because it's just hard to tell. And Hills acknowledges in Believing Bible Study, it can be really hard to tell the difference, because for them, these are just two subcategories of the same type of thing. Whether it's uncertainty about the translation or uncertainty about the text, it's just broadly differences of readings. So Smith takes up the case of, should we have differences of readings? I want to read to you a quote from him. Actually, before I do that, let me read a quote from Samuel Ward. At the Synod of Dort, uh, Samuel he, Ward— He was a King James translator. He was a King James translator. Went to Dort to represent— That's right. One of four of the British delegations sent to Dort by King James to represent uh, the British interest. Um, there's huge debate about how much— that actually reflected Anglicanism at the time, how much it reflected James. But in any case, while they were at Dort, there was enough respect already for the King James Bible that as they were producing a new Dutch translation, they said, tell us what you guys did. You guys have done a really good job in creating this new English translation or revision of the bishops a couple years ago. What was your procedure? And uh, Samuel Ward is called upon then to summarize the principles that they worked with. And he summarizes it under seven headings. Interestingly enough, we still have his draft of that report in his own hand, which is interesting and fun. And then we have the official published form of it that's been recently published in a critical edition. Have but you seen that one in his own hand? I haven't. If you have it, I'd love an image okay. of it. I want to get a hold of it. I've very, I know you've, you've actually gone to places. I have, but that one I have not. It's in the collection that was studied by Margot Todd. Um, so all I have is her notes about it. I haven't actually read it. She basically says it's almost impossible to read Latin. And the guy had horrible handwriting. But no, anyway. Nobody knows this stuff better than Tim. I've never met anybody who knows off the top of his head stuff that I had no idea about. It's well. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me zoom in on, on that note. If you they get say, this mug, you can know it too. That's right. And we'll be selling them for twenty nine ninety. No, I'm just kidding. He, he said this. They said, tell us what you did. And I'm just going to quote one part of that. He says, when a Hebrew or Greek word admits two meanings of a suitable kind, the one was to be expressed in the text, the other in the margin. The same to be done where a different reading was found in good copies. Different reading means textual variant, copies means manuscripts. So he's seeing both of these practices as covered under the idea of differences of reading. And he's saying, we put in the margin, in some places, differences of reading. Sometimes it's a translational uncertainty. Sometimes it's a textual uncertainty, but they're both differences of reading. 
So with that in mind, I want to read to you a quote from Miles Smith's preface. I'll admit that I could be wrong about this, but I think Miles Smith is talking in that section about broadly those double vertical line notes, which includes both translation uncertainties and textual uncertainties. And here's what he says. Now, in such a case, doth not a margin do well to admonish the reader to seek further and not to conclude or dogmatize upon this or that preemptorily? For as it is a fault of incredulity to doubt of those things that are evident, so to determine of such things as the Spirit of God hath left, even in the judgment of the judicious, questionable, can be no less than presumption. And then he says this, just a few sentences later, they that are wise had rather have their judgments at liberty in differences of readings than to be captivated to one when it may be the other. He's saying sometimes, I think, I know for sure he's saying sometimes the translation is unsure. And I think he's also saying sometimes the text is unsure and we shouldn't dogmatize. We should allow liberty Protectual uncertainty. Oh my goodness, Tim, that is so powerful. And I have to say that is something you taught me because I read that preface carefully multiple times looking for them to make any comment about textual criticism and I couldn't find it. And I think here you have built a careful case where you're acknowledging there's some lack of clarity here. I think you're gently blaming the King James translators, but in essence, I think you correct me here. Anybody can that this helps us a little bit because it shows that they weren't taking this as seriously as textual absolutists do. Like if they were doing all of this work in the context of faith and the preservation of God's word as defined by the textual absolutist, they would have talked about this in a very different mm. way. Uh, d does that strike you as accurate? Yeah, I, I think for them, for the most part, they don't divide and distinguish between translation uncertainty, textual uncertainty. It's just kind of broadly under the fact that I wouldn't use the phrase not take it seriously. Sure. I would say they don't land at a textual absolutist framework that doesn't allow for textual uncertainty. Yeah, they yeah. just clearly admitted that there was some. And I think, you know, this is something that's actually really helpful is that, you know, there is way more ambiguity of passages. We just don't know for sure what they mean than there are passages yes, that right. we don't know for sure what they say. That is right. so important. And the fact that they see these two as basically two instances of the same thing. Kind of thing. That you know, there are way more passages where our lack of knowledge of ancient geography yeah. or ancient culture hinder our understanding of what's going on than ambiguity as to the reading. And so if you want to say that we can't trust if we don't have any ambiguity, ambiguity undermines trust. Right. Then uncertainty undermines trust. Uncertainty, right, uncertainty yeah. undermines trust or, you know, being, you know, yeah, that uncertainty undermines trust. Then you just have to undermine trust because there's no way around the fact that everything isn't spelled out. And I think it, it goes yes. back to that idea yep. that it's a treating of the words as having magical power right. Right. rather than meaning power. Right. I don't want to throw my faith away just because when I'm reading through Paul and I get to because of the angels and I have no idea what that means. <laughs> right. They're like, oh, the whole thing's useless then. But so, I don't think, you know, there may not be textual uncertainty there. No. Sure. But there's certainly interpretational uncertainty. Exactly. And if you think that you have everything nailed down, then your problem is a really basic one of pride. Yep, exactly. It, it just is. I have felt that this is super important for a long time. Um, so the King James translators, we're acknowledging some uncertainty of our own as to whether they were talking about text as well as translation. We're acknowledging no uncertainty as to whether they were talking about translation. Sure. They were open to marginal readings that gave alternate translations. They also say very specifically that they ran across words, especially in the Old Testament, that they weren't sure of the meaning of. And they just, and they think that even the Jews, they say, just wrote something down just to write something down because even they didn't know. They specifically mention you know, uh, obscure animals or precious stones or something like that. And I've often thought if the textual absolutist perspective is correct, that we have to have every single word and every single jot and tittle, all in the right order, none added, none missing, or all of it's worthless, wouldn't that have to also apply to, you know, technical name for it would be Lexus, mm. the, the meaning of words. What if God hasn't preserved for us with certainty the meaning of individual Hebrew or even Greek words? W with Hebrew, it's harder because we just don't have much Hebrew, hardly at all, from outside the Old Testament. And even when we do, it's inscriptions of the Old Testament often. Um, whereas in Greek, we have secular literature that we can look at. Even there, there are some uncertainties. Why did God leave those? What, what of what? Uh, how does a textual absolutist perspective handle it? 
yeah. when there are words whose meaning we, we uh, don't know. And I think it's so fascinating and helpful that, Tim, you show that the King James translators actually brought those categories together. Whether the uncertainty is in the meaning of a given Hebrew or Greek word or in which variant we should go with, yeah. end result ends up being the same kind of uncertainty. Right. The and same that un- symbol in the margin covers both because it's the same thing for them. That itself is a great point. Uh, and they certainly did not have a textual absolutist perspective, and they certainly did not conclude we've got to throw up our hands and this whole effort is worthless since right. we don't have certainty about everything. One but, of my professors uh, actually gave a lecture uh, back at my alma mater. It was just a real delight. It was a huge honor to have my former Old Testament Hebrew professor sitting there in front of me and his wife who taught me calligraphy. They came to support me and he's just brilliant and quirky, if you know Dr. Bob Bell. And he said, that logic continues. If, if I don't have a perfect text, then I don't have any truth, okay? Well, if I don't have a, a perfect knowledge of the meaning of that text, then I don't have anything yep. worth having. Well, then, then if I don't have a, a perfect interpretation of that text, I don't have anything. Then if I don't have a perfect interpreter to tell me mm-hmm. which of all the interpretations are right, then I don't have anything worth having. We have to, at some point, acknowledge not just fallenness, but finiteness. Right. It's in 1 Corinthians 13, then, I think, in the eschaton, then I will know, even as also I am known. We are not arguing for maximum uncertainty, for a postmodern relativism, certainly for a skepticism. We're the textual confidence collective, but we think that that absolutism at all these levels of interpretation, of translation, of text— violates the world as God has actually given it to us. Yeah. Let, let me say one other thing there too, as we tie together the thought about really a textual absolutist presupposition is uncomfortable with uncertainty. And it, at, at its core, it works from the presupposition that uncertainty of text, translation, or interpretation undermines biblical authority, which is exactly what skeptics then pick up and level against the Christian faith that because there's uncertainty of interpretation, translation, or text, you therefore don't have an authoritative Bible. And in older absolutist streams, those things end up influencing one another. So we talked about Trent decreeing, oh, there's so much debate now about the text and translation, just the said vulgar Latin. But they took the same move to go, you know what? Interpretation's uncertain too. And everybody's coming up with different interpretations. Now you have to follow the, the stated teaching of the church in interpreting the text because uncertainty in either pushes against this absolutist uh, mentality. Here's what Erasmus said against that. I just want to read one quick line from him, and then we can move on to whatever else you wanted to, to talk about. He talks about scribes and printers and how they make mistakes in the text. He would include, quote unquote, the translator too. He doesn't think it was Jerome of the Vulgate. He just talks about the translator who did the original Latin. But he says this in responding to his critics in uh, the 1535 edition in the Capitum that he publishes at the front. He says, sad indeed, is the plight of sacred scripture. If its authority depends on uneducated scribes, and such they usually are, or drunken printers, listen to what he's saying there. He's saying how weak a view of scripture it would be if scribes making mistakes, printers making mistakes, translators making mistakes, interpreters making mistakes could destroy the authority of scripture. Because he was a textual confidence adherent. Wow, and so are we. We're against the peremptory dogmatizing collective. We're the textual confidence collective. (laughs) So let's get back a little bit to the story of the King James. We've already referenced this in a way several times. Scrivener's Greek New Testament, which is the standard edition of the Greek New Testament within King James onlyism. It is a record of the textual critical decisions of the King James translators. It therefore never existed until 1881 when it was called for because up till then it was – There was only one standard, really, English translation, and anybody who really needed to know um, what the Greek text was saying as in contradistinction to it could look. But then when the 1881 English Revised Version was being constructed, the syndics at the University of Cambridge – I wish I knew what a syndic was. It's some kind of – group of like 10 men that are in charge of the printing. Okay, great. Thank you. Once again, still there. I had to get yeah. permission yeah. from them. Awesome. Oh, did you? You can look up their names and They're who's still currently alive. holding that position. Awesome. Different men, but it's they a different asked. position. <laughs> <laughs> They're hey, not that old. If, if the position's that men, old. I want to get that job. <laughs> those men yeah. aren't. <laughs> they, they can barely move. Anyway, they asked, <laughs> they asked Scrivener 
to to um, re uh, reconstruct well, the well, the text. Let me right? back up just a bit to explain some of what happened there. So when convocation commissioned the revision of the King James Bible that became the English Revised Version, one part of their instruction was to list in the margin every place that they had departed from the original text behind the King James Version. They had not initially planned to make that big of a departure. And as they begun their work, uh, looked at textual criticism present that day, we'll talk more about that history in I think the next session or two sessions from now, they realized that's going to really clutter the margin with loads of marginal notes. But that's what we've been commissioned to do. So we're honest Christian scholars who want to do what we've been told to. So let's instead print the Greek text behind the KJV and just list all the places we disagree with it. And that Scrivener's specialty was the KJV. He'd been writing on it since 1845. They said, you do that. And then they realized, oh, we've got a problem. That text has never been published. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. Because the King James translators made text critical decisions between text, the actual Greek text behind the KJV New Testament had never been printed. Right, and right. That's when Scrivener did that work that you had mentioned to reconstruct that text and finally print it as a companion volume to the English Revised Version of 1881. And picking up on a thread from earlier, you said that Erasmus and Beza did not have textual absolutist views. They were doing textual criticism. Right. They saw the practical value, the pragmatic value of basically retaining the text as it's been handed to them, the received mm -hmm. text. But they didn't always agree with the text right. that they actually placed. And that is exactly the situation with Scrivener. I right. did a talk on this uh, and I demonstrate very clearly Scrivener took a view in broadly similar to Westcott and Hort. You know, he was able to disagree with them. You have pushed back a little bit on that part. Yeah. I'll give you a second to do that. A, I'll give you a chance to do that in a second. But uh, he didn't take a textual absolutist right, view. For that's, sure. that's my main sure. point. And he used a lot of the same canons of textual criticism that Westcott and Hort did. He had a different estimate of the value of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus For than sure. Westcott Hort did. That was the biggest difference that I saw when I went through yeah. his lectures on textual criticism. But he he inveys against, I mean, this is kind of his wording. I don't remember the particular word, but I'm pretty sure it's like this, the stupidity of the people who think that 1 John 5, 7 ought to be included. And yet it's in Scrivener's Greek New Testament. Why? Because his point was not to give us the absolute right. scripture that R.B. Ouellette says he was doing. He said, Ouellette says that Scrivener was on his textual absolutist side. Just yeah. utterly no idea. Ouellette has no idea he why Scrivener he printed, did. Scrivener printed his text after choosing to distance himself exactly. from the liberals Horton Westcott. Right. And when actually he's doing that work as part of basically the same overall team. He's on the same committee. <laughs> that's producing the English Revised Version. And, and just the, you know, the fact that the TR that most TR institutions use is an addition of Scrivener with all of his notes and introduction cut out and their own introduction put right. in that it's like, no, that, and without any, indi you know, any indication that this text, when this text comes yeah. from or whatever, it's just, I don't think it's ethical. No, I agree. I, I actually have a blog post where I, I explained Scrivener's history and then just wrote out his whole preface because it was so weird to me. We went to the same Bible college. I got my copy of the Scrivener text from TBS there and it didn't have the preface explaining that it was. So my teachers taught what you just said. We used Ouellette's book as a textbook in one of my grad school classes. And I thought Scrivener was printing the text that he thought was verbally identical to the autographs. And I remember being floored when I read his preface to that text a few years later and went, that just blatantly misrepresents him. Right. That There's, again, a different kind of slander, pulling somebody onto your team when they would have absolutely said, no, I am not on your team. The King James translators, Stephanus, Beza, Erasmus, Scrivener, all of them are claimed for the King James only side, for the textual absolutist side. And we have demonstrated it is utterly obvious that they were not on that side. The Bible is supposed to be for the plowboy. And I want to pull us back to the whole purpose of translation. I want to ask Peter, who's done some reading, I know, on William Tyndale to talk to us about, like, you just clear, clear away some of the... Uh, controversy that has come since Tyndale's time. Um, well, I suppose some of it was already there because of Erasmus's work be, uh, coming out then, but talk to us about what William Tyndale thought he was doing when he gave us what in a way ultimately became the King James Bible because something like 86% or something of Tyndale's work in the 83.7 in the New Testament um, is carried over directly in the King James Bible. He was really the first major evangelical uh, English Bible translator. Tell us about Tyndale. Well, you know, he's trying to give the Bible uh, 
it, you know, give the Bible to people so that they can read it, to ordinary people, so that they can read, read the Bible for themselves. He's trying to do what Luther did, you know, where Luther, you know, the, Tyndale is very, very influenced by Luther. And, you know, Luther is giving, giving the Bible to people in language they can understand. There were already German translations uh, before Luther came along, but they just weren't readable. They weren't, they weren't clear. They weren't understandable. And I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, they weren't from the, you know, Greek and Hebrew text. They were from Latin. There was, there was obscurity. There was difficulty. And he's trying to clear away the obstacles so that people can read it. And I, I just, a few days ago, well, a little, little bit ago, I was reading a book about William Tyndale, a kid's book to my children you know, before bed about Tyndale. And I just started weeping, just thinking about um, <clears throat> his love for children, for, for, for ordinary people. That doesn't make ordinary people Bible scholars or mean that we don't need Bible scholars because clearly Tyndale put a lot of work into being, being a scholar. But the whole point of being a scholar is to be a bridge so that it reaches ordinary people. To serve so to, ordinary to serve people. And, and to, to, to take that away and to say, well, no, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it. It doesn't matter if it doesn't reach you. Then it's like, what's the whole point of having a translation to begin with? If it's just this magic text, then just photocopy a Greek manuscript. Find the perfect Greek manuscript and photocopy it. What's the point of having a translation if it doesn't translate so that, not that it takes away all ambiguity, not that it takes away all obscurity, because as we've already seen, that can't be done, but that it takes away as much as possible so that people can see as clearly as possible the truth of God's word so that, you know, my, you know, my six-year-old daughter who's just learning to read can read the Bible for herself. And, and you know, my son who's turning, turning nine here in a few days, he's reading through the Bible. He's almost, I think he's read almost the whole Bible and he's, he's reading the Bible. And I want him to be able to read it for himself and to be able to ask crazy questions about the Bible. Uh, and, and, you know, like I want, I want my kids to be able to get the Bible and I, I don't want anyone taking it away from them or giving them, you know, making it needlessly hard. Right. And, and that's what the archaisms of the King James now do. And I love the King James version. We all love the King James version. My big case in authorized is if I'm going to uphold the principles of the King James translators, then I'm going to want to, I'm going to have the same values they do. And they said, and I love their illustrations. We're going to take off the, the lid from the well, from Jacob's well, so that the poor can come and draw. Uh, and, and they give this kind of obscure citation from Isaiah where, you know, someone says, drink this. And how can I, um, or no, read this. How can I, because it is sealed. Um, I don't want God's word to be sealed away from the understanding of people because of any unnecessary difficulty. There is difficulty in scripture. Peter said that a lot of what Paul wrote in the King James, it's translated, is hard to be understood. And certainly Jesus says things that are obscure and demanding. And there were times when he purposefully withheld truth from people by telling them parables. But that isn't the character of the entire Bible. The Bible is given to Christians. And just as Jesus's explanations were given to those disciples, we get the whole Bible telling us God's truth. And we don't just have great illustrations from the King James translators and sort of a renaissance humanist ideal in which, you know, we're going to try to make the the sources accessible to people. We actually do have Bible here. And this is where, well, my favorite passage on this topic comes in, 1 Corinthians 14. Um, of course, 1 Corinthians 14, the topic is uh, speaking in tongues and the way that the Corinthian Christians were abusing this gift that the Spirit had given to them. Are you got 1 Corinthians 14 open there for us? Let me take a look here, just make sure I get it word perfect. Absolutely. Verse 9, Paul says, Likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And repeatedly in this chapter, Paul gives the same principle. Edification requires intelligibility. People are not going to grow in their faith unless they can understand what you're saying. He gives an illustration of a non-Christian man coming into the service, falling down and confessing God is in you of a truth because he hears you speaking words of prophecy that he can actually understand. Um, 1 Corinthians 14 absolutely, I believe, does apply to Bible translation and Pretty much everybody in the textual absolutism world tells me, oh no, that passage is only about speaking in tongues. And I'm thinking, we were talking about this earlier, does that mean it has utterly no relevance now that you know tongues are no longer used in the church? Uh, if, if, if in your church there are no tongues, then we just can just skip this in, the, in our uh, exposition through 1 Corinthians 14. But you know who actually used 1 Corinthians 14 
in a discussion about Bible translation and applied it to Bible translation. The King James translators in their preface. Um, I would like to have somebody here give me a little summary then about textual absolutism. Can we have that before we conclude? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say we've talked two or three sessions now about textual absolutism. If someone asked me, Tim, in a nutshell, what's the problem that you have with every form of textual absolutism and its claims all across that spectrum or all through the past? I would say it's two things, really simply, a problem with its argument and a problem with its conclusion. First, a problem with its argument. Any form of the text that you take and exalt as an absolute standard above revision is already the product of revision. Whether you're choosing a manuscript that has made changes to its previous exemplar, an edition where the editors have done textual criticism, a translation where the translators have used a product of revision, uh, the King James Bible, which is a revision of the 1602 Bishop's Bible, pick whatever form you want. If you take that form of the text and say, this is an absolute standard, we can't revise it, you have to answer the question, the very simple question, why did God approve of all the revision before that point, but disapprove of all the revision after that point? And there's several different answers that have been given them, that have been given. None of them are logically sufficient to say, this is where uh, the text and its revision terminates, except for, and Peter, you said this earlier, except for the claim of Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman understood that the only really sufficient way to make that argument is to say the King James translators were inspired by God with advanced revelation. Now you might say it's bad theology, but it's logically sufficient to ground that claim. Apart from that argument, and almost nobody I know today defending the KJV or the TR wants to make that argument. They're wise enough to sense this is bad theology. But apart from that argument, there is no sufficient way to say God approved of all the revision up to the TR or the KJV, whatever form you want to pick, and disapproves of all revision after. I've had somebody, or I've, I think I've heard the objection, you know, you have to show me from the TR where the TR says it's okay for you to have the ESV and modern text criticism. And I, I kind of want to say to that, no, you have to show me from the Greek manuscripts mm. why the TR is okay right. um, bef before, you know. You yeah. So, so we claim the legacy of the King James translators. We are taking these major figures saying they're on the textual confidence side and they rejected absolutism. We think textual confidence offers a better path forward. And in our next session, we're going to move on to now consider some of the nitty gritty that I promised earlier, some of the materials for textual confidence. If indeed toil is required by God and his providence, what are we supposed to toil on? Come back for that discussion. Thank you for listening to the Textual Confidence Collective. You can find this podcast on Dr. Mark Ward's YouTube channel and anywhere else you find audio podcasts be sure to visit our website, www.textualconfidence.com.